MX or mixed wheel sizes is where you've got business up front and party in the back, and they're becoming more and more popular. But why would you run different size wheels on your bike? Will it be faster? Will it mess up my geometry? Let's find out if the hype matches reality. We're going to try and sort fact from fiction and explain everything that you need to know about running a mixed wheel size setup on your bike, if it's even possible. But before we dive into the tech, I've got a favour to ask, and that's if you can like and subscribe to the channel and to this video. It really helps us make really good content. Thank you. Mixed wheel size is new and exciting. Well, it might be exciting, but it's not new. Cannondale, since the 80s, ran mixed wheel size bikes. One of their classics, the Beast of the East, ran a 24 inch rear wheel and a 26 inch front. Specialized in the 2000s had a model called the Big Hit, a really long travel free ride bike that had a 24 inch back wheel and a 26 inch front wheel. You can see there's a bit of a theme here. I mean, some say that Specialized was modified because the head angle was a bit too steep. Another range of bikes that came out in a similar time frame was Trek's 69er range. These were 29er front wheels and 26 inch rear wheels, hence the name. And there was a whole range of them, but they didn't really, well, get any traction and take off. On the race scene, it's been a while since we've had mixed wheel size, and that's because there was UCI laws about running mixed wheels. But Danny Hart was probably one of the first that we saw racing it in around 2019. So are mixed wheels any faster? We're gonna do a little experiment to try and find out. We've got this propane tie which we can change, thanks to a flip chip, to run either 2929 or 29650. We've got matching wheels. So we've got these Reynolds carbon wheels and we've got a matching 650B rear version as well. So same width, we're trying to minimize anything that might be different. Likewise, we're gonna run the same rear tire, same width, same carcass, same model. Obviously it will be a different diameter because the back wheel will be different. We've got a track that's got a good variety of steep sections, rocky square edges, and well, a really fun variety of enjoyable, engaging trails, just to see what the different ride feel is. 2929, run one, here goes. Okay, that's 29.29er, um, and yeah, I mean, it feels it feels kind of fast, but in a sort of slow, controlled, slightly muted way. Uh, on the steeper sections, yeah, I did did have interaction. I did have tire buzz, and it did it was a bit off-putting, I've got to say. But I've got short legs, so I think if you've got longer legs, you'd probably not notice. And maybe my body position wasn't perfect. Maybe I was getting too far back. Well, maybe I wasn't centered in the in the bike enough. Okay, run two. Now we've got the 650B rear wheel, the mixed wheel size. Let's see how it goes. Well, that was really interesting. I, I didn't think, because we hadn't got much geometry change, and effectively on, on paper, it feels like there's not that much changed. But on the bike, on the hill, there's so much change. There's more ability for me to kind of like actually push in. I've got lots more confidence, even though it kind of felt like the ride was a lot more dynamic, a lot more poppy for another better word. I guess also I noticed under braking, it, it felt, yeah, dynamic is the best word, but I could feel the back wheel braking a lot more but it felt like I was still in control of it a little bit more than the, the 29er rear. Interesting. I guess you want to know what the times are. Well, before we find out the times, just got to do a bit of nerding. When 29ers first appeared on the scene, there was lots of arguments and, well, lots of statements from brands saying that they were faster because of, well, different things with the wheels. And one of them is impedance losses. And that's because the angle of attack of the wheel, because the different diameter, means it can roll over objects better. The other thing is that because of that different diameter, it has a different contact patch. And because of that, A, it can grip better, but also there might be less hysteresis. Now, 10, 15, 20 years on from those early 29ers, the science is there. The data proves that for cross-country riding, they are faster. 
So, if you're riding ultra-long endeavours over rolling terrain where you're looking for efficiency and speed and comfort, 29ers are a really good option. Here's to who? Impedance watts? Okay, yeah, these are kind of slightly weird technical terms, but they are useful to describe lots of things that are going on. Hysteresis first. Okay, this is the energy losses that happen when the tire is rolling through its carcass. So if you think of the carcass flexing down just here, it's flexing all the time. And some of that flex is absorbing energy and how much depends on the carcass and lots of other stuff. But the bigger wheels of 29er, because of this different contact patch, mean that they've got less losses and they roll more efficiently. Impedance losses. These are kind of complex, but 29er wheels, because of their approach angle, so it's a, a shallower angle, so it means that it can roll over things, means that it's less likely to have impedance losses. A good example of this is a skateboard rolling along and the size of the bump that you need, because they're a really small wheel that's going to have to lift the whole skateboard up. That lifting up, that's the impedance loss. Now with a really big wheel, those losses are just less. So a 29er wheel can roll more efficiently. Since those early 29ers arrived on the scene, where and how we're riding, what we're riding regularly, has changed radically too. From traditional cross country to, well, new school cross country. Riding has changed radically. We're riding really burly, really steep stuff, a lot more regularly. As 29ers developed and got longer and longer travel, it meant designers were more challenged. Why? Well, when a bike's got 160 mil of travel, it means that, well, as you might imagine, the rear wheel is gonna move about 160 mil. So to design that into a bike with reasonable chainstay lengths and the one that you're not gonna have impacts where the rear tire is gonna interface with either the seat or the seat post, is a challenge. But it's not only the bike design of packaging stuff in a long travel format that's a challenge for 29ers. No, another challenge can be the riders. DH racers were later to adopt full 29ers, full wagon wheels. And one of the reasons is, well, it's difficult to package a really big wheel and full 200 mil travel that you get on a downhill bike. But the other reason is probably to do with tire buzz and not tire buzz on the frame, no tire buzz on the person. Downhill racers need lots of weight shift to make sure that the wheels stay on the ground and track. And on really steep terrain, you need to get your weight really far back and quite low. And those shorter stature, well, tire buzz is a real issue and a real problem. What am I talking about? I'm talking about literally interface between my butt and this tire. As an example, this rear tire with the tire on and with the wheel all, all set up is around 745 millimeters. My inside leg is only about 760 millimeters. So that only gives me about 15 mil of clearance, which is not a lot. And actually on the bike, it'll be even less. So if you're a shorter rider and you're riding the gravity side of mountain biking, where you're into steep drops and steep descents and technical stuff where you're having to do radical weight shifts on the rear, maybe the smaller wheels will be better. Apart from greater crotch clearance, what are the other advantages or disadvantages of running a 650B or 275 rear wheel with a 29er up front? Well, there can be really radical geometry changes. Thankfully, this bike, Propane, TIE, has got a flip chip here and it's been designed specifically to work with a 650B rear wheel or a 29er. So when I change this flip chip, it keeps the geometry more or less exactly the same depending on which wheel and which configuration. But if your bike isn't designed for this, you could void your warranty. So you might be able to go wild with offset bushings and maybe angle sets to change the geometry and work around the changes that the different wheel size will have on the bike. It's probably not recommended unless the bike is specifically designed for it, like this one. The different diameter wheels are gonna create a different footprint. So even though we've got the same tire in the same carcass and the same width, and they measure up the same, that footprint is gonna be a different shape. And that means it's gonna grip and roll differently. It's also gonna have a different mass as well. They're gonna weigh differently. And that's because, well, the 29er is bigger. So there's more carbon, there's longer spokes. And that extra mass means that there's gonna be more inertia. So it's gonna take more energy, so probably more time to get up to speed. So it will ride differently. And dynamic changes, sideways movements, or kind of locking up a wheel will also feel differently because of that different weight. Purely in the lab, 29ers do roll quicker. And I'm saying that because some Swiss scientists about 10 years ago did a really detailed study for the Swiss 
Swiss Olympic cross country team that proved that 29er wheels were faster. Okay, that was for cross country racing and that is racing uphill and downhill. Not really enjoying the downhill and sort of just surviving the climb. So it will be a little bit different. On paper at least, the smaller wheels, because they've got less mass, should have less inertia. And that means accelerations should be quicker with the smaller wheels. But I think once you're rolling, those differences between the different inertia fields of the different weights of wheels, well, it doesn't really match up with the reality. Of course, if your specific trails are really stop and go, then yes, it could make a difference. But for general rolling, I'm not sure it's gonna factor that much. Switching to a smaller, lighter 650B rear wheel will change the balance between the sprung mass and the unsprung mass. Should you care about this? Yeah, you should. It's quite difficult to describe, but effectively, we want the forces that we want to absorb to move the suspension system and not the mainframe of the bike. And balancing our sprung mass to our unsprung mass can help this. Otherwise, we're gonna ask our suspension systems to do a lot. So the lighter rear wheel should help the suspension. <laughs> Square edge bumps, 29ers are really good at tackling these and that's because they've got a reduced approach angle. But suspension designers and suspension designers that can play with the rear axle path of the suspension system are really key in helping 650B bikes work almost as well as 29ers. The gearing will change. Now, I know initially this sounds bonkers because all you're doing is changing the back wheel, but by changing the back wheel, specifically the rolling out diameter, that's gonna change the gear ratios. So it's gonna change how far one pedal stroke will take you. It changes all of the gears as well, so it makes them all slightly lower. So it means that your spinny gear will be slightly more spinny, so hopefully be able to crawl up even steeper stuff, but it will make your big crank it out on the fire road gear a little bit less tall. So you may have to go up a chain ring size to get the same ratio as you had before. Wheel stiffness. Okay, the rim is the same diameter and these carbon ones from Reynolds should feel very similar, but what will be different is the spoke length. And longer spokes will flex a little bit more. Even if we play with tension, there is gonna be a different dynamic ride feel. What do we mean by that? Well, uh, it means that the smaller wheel could be a little bit stiffer, so it might be nicer to load in turns. It might feel better to push through. Conversely, the 2901 might be more compliant and actually have less trail chatter through. On a suspension bike, that trail chatter might not make much of a difference, but there will be a subtle different flavor to both wheels. Okay, despite what you might think, whilst we could switch the rear wheel, it doesn't actually change the wheelbase, at least on this bike. And that's because we're using a flip chip, but the distance from the bottom bracket to the rear axle doesn't change. So the wheelbase isn't gonna change. However, not all brands do it like this. And some brands make dedicated 275 or 650B rear ends. And on those bikes, then there's gonna be some more changes to that dynamic ride feel it's gonna be a little bit shorter. So that might mean it's a little bit more poppy and a bit more playful on the trail. Conversely, it's also gonna be, well, maybe a little bit less stable at speed because the overall wheelbase is gonna be shorter. Like a number of brands, Reynolds allows you to buy either 29, 29 wheel set, 275, 275 wheel set, or a mixed wheel size in a lot of its range, which is really nice to have. Bottom bracket height versus bottom bracket drop. Okay, bottom bracket height is relatively easy. That's just the height of the bottom bracket off the ground, the BB bottom bracket, same thing. Okay, BB drop. This is where the bottom bracket will drop down or where its situation is between the two wheel axles. Now, on a bike like this, the bottom bracket height, when we flip the flip chip, will stay pretty much the same. So the height will be the same, but the BB drop where that bottom bracket sits between the two axles is gonna change, and that will have some dynamic ride changes. It's probably gonna make it feel like it's easier to manual, and it's not because we're shortening the back end at all, it's just we're changing the ratio of where my feet are and where the bottom bracket is to where the rear axle is, so where I'm pivoting for manuals. So yeah, it's another factor where the small changes in BB height slash BB drop can make a big difference to the ride, and that's where the 650B wheel 
could come through with the goods. Okay, that was a lot of nerding. Thanks for sticking with us. Uh, you want to know the times. I'm sure you're keen to know. Okay, well, 29.29 set up. Um, I'd done a couple of runs beforehand, so I had warmed up. Uh, but yeah, 1.41, so 1 minute 41 seconds, which I was pretty pleased with it. I, there weren't any major mistakes. I wasn't able to attack that much. And I think, um, yeah, the next time, for me, was very surprising. 138, 1 minute 38, and that was for the mixed wheel size bike. So the 650B in the, in the back really did change the ride a lot for me. I felt like it gave me a lot more confidence. Um, in terms of where I'm getting that confidence from, I'm not really sure. The bike feels a lot more dynamic. It was easier to lift the front up, so that helped me feel a bit more confident. I think the other thing, it was easier to manual a little bit, and again, weight the back wheel, which is kind of hard to describe, and especially as it's smaller, you'd think it'd be a bit more difficult. The other thing that I found really interesting is, is in turns. The bike felt I could kind of set a course and change it, whereas the 29er was just set on one arc. Um, it was really interesting. I've got to say, I was really surprised that this bike was quicker. I think the other factor was that on some of the kind of rollovers, the steeper sections, with this bike, with the mixed wheel size, I was able to commit a lot more and I was able to actually almost to sort of pre-jump into them, which I've got to be honest, I tried on the 29er before, or you might have seen how I'd gone on the 29, 29 before in Bike Park Wales, it didn't end pretty. And I think that had really knocked my confidence, but with more crotch clearance, this bike for me did feel faster. Okay, what are your thoughts? Have you tried mixed wheel size? Is it better for you? Is it quicker for you? For me and my little legs, I'm a real fan, right more riding time.